best thing that ever happened to Maurice Claret. He says it wasn't winning the national championship as a star running back at Ohio State University. It was being sent to prison. As a child, Maurice Claret showed so much promise, but unfortunately, these promises never materialized as his life took a rather unexpected turn. The college football superstar, who many thought had the potential to break into the NFL, would never actually step foot on an NFL field. Instead, he would later be arrested and convicted for armed robbery. The story of Maurice Claret is a mix of college football stardom, legal troubles, personal demons, and a shot at redemption. A story of dreams that never came true. Youngstown, Ohio, known for its streets beaming with crime, was the birthplace of Maurice Claret in the year 1982. And like it was not enough to grow up in such a dangerous city, Maurice Claret had a difficult childhood as part of a broken family. His father was absent throughout his life, and his mother struggled with addiction. As a kid, he witnessed a friend of his shot to death by a stray bullet, and as expected, these experiences left a scar on the life of Maurice Claret. But at the beginning, Maurice didn't seem too affected by his upbringing and background. In school, both his classmates and his teachers saw him as a good boy as he exhibited good character. From a young age, Maurice Claret found solace in sports, especially American football. He played football at Austin Town Fitch High School and quickly developed into a star player. Claret's hard work and talent earned him national attention and he transferred to Warren G. Harding High School to showcase his skills on a bigger stage. At Harding, Claret excelled both on and off the field. On the field, he led his team to a state championship and was named the Ohio Mr. Football. Off the field, Claret maintained a high GPA and received numerous accolades for his academic achievements. After a stellar high school career, just after graduating, national publications ranked him among the top 100 players nationally, a very big achievement for an Ohio-born. But that wasn't all. Aside from being a U.S. Army All-American in 2002, Claret received a scholarship offer from Ohio State University, the University of Miami, Fresno State, and even Notre Dame. Maurice, however, verbally committed to Ohio State over other offers because it was a dream come true for him. He had always wanted to play for the Buckeyes. Maurice started at Ohio State for one season, rushing for 1,237 yards and scoring 18 touchdowns, helping the Buckeyes to a 14-0 record and the BCS National Championship. He achieved all these as a freshman. His initial start at Ohio State was pleasant, but not until 2002. As a star with that much attention, it wasn't too long before all the college fame got to his head. Maurice Claret started misbehaving. He got preferential treatment and this made him feel above the law. It first started with his behavior towards his coach and teachers. During the Northwestern Ohio State game in the 2002 season, he was even seen yelling at his position coach. In December of that same year, Maurice got the sad news that would impact his attitude going forward negatively. His childhood friend, Juan Bell, who was only 23 years old, lost his life after being shot multiple times. It was a very difficult period for Maurice, and the Ohio State rules made it even more difficult. Maurice naturally wanted to fly back to Youngstown to attend the funeral of his friend, but according to him, he was given a runaround when he asked to fly back home for the funeral service. From that moment, everything went on a gradual decline. Maurice claimed the school officials never answered his request to fly home for the funeral because of the upcoming championship game. According to him, Ohio State didn't want to shift their attention from their national championship to inner city violence. An Ohio State rep came out to say Maurice did not file the proper paperwork, but then things became even more confusing when Andy Geiger, Ohio State athletic director, said Maurice was permitted to fly home on the condition that he bought his ticket home and back, after which he would be reimbursed when the paperwork had been filed. He further went on to say he was unsure why Maurice remained adamant about the conditions he was given. It was a little confusing as to why he would do that, and this was between him not having enough money to finance it or just wanting to disobey and stand on what he wanted. Maurice was not from a well-to-do family, and perhaps funding his journey was a little too expensive, or he simply wanted to disregard authority. According to the director, they were at a spot where they couldn't get tickets for him, so it wasn't the school's fault. 
Youngstown, where Maurice lived, is about a two and a half hour drive from Ohio State, so while a ticket seemed expensive, a quick drive could have solved the issue since the event was important, but Maurice didn't consider that option. A sign of a young man who was slowly becoming arrogant. After the funeral, Ohio State went on to win the national championship game with Maurice putting forth an outstanding performance. Stripping the ball from the late great Sean Taylor after the quarterback threw a pick, and also scoring the game-winning touchdown in double overtime, finishing his freshman season with 1,200 plus yards and 18 touchdowns. As a player, Maurice was impressive, but off the field, he often found himself shrouded in controversy. In July 2003, Maurice became the center of an academic scandal when a teaching assistant told the New York Times that Claret had received preferential treatment from professors, claiming he had not attended any classes during his only year at Ohio State. She added that Maurice left class when a test was about to be conducted, but later was given an oral test as a special treatment when he passed. However, the investigation did not find sufficient evidence of academic misconduct and was later dissolved. Following several bad behaviors and detention, Maurice was suspended for the 2003 season on September 10, 2003. After his dismissal from Ohio State, he moved to Los Angeles, and while living there, he got into more trouble. More than $10,000 in clothes, CDs, cash, and stereo equipment was stolen from a vehicle that Maurice borrowed from a local dealership when he was given the wrong car. Most people, including Maurice himself, believed the dealership did it on purpose. That was a good way to inflate Maurice's debt so he could get more later. But it still made sense that it could have been Maurice when backed down from the police he initially invited. Some say that he withdrew because of the threats he got for involving the police in the first place. Maurice's charges were falsification and misdemeanor for the police report on the theft. And the charges carried penalties ranging from probation to six months in jail and a $1,000 fine. At this point in Maurice's life, he needed money to offset loans and put himself together, and his plan to settle those needs was to join the NFL. To do this, he sued to be included in the 2004 NFL Draft. In his attempt to enter the 2004 NFL Draft, Maurice challenged the NFL's rule that a player must be in college for three years to be eligible to declare for the draft. Initially, it was ruled based on antitrust grounds that the NFL could not bar Claret from participating in the 2004 Draft. However, this decision was later overturned by the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, in an opinion by Judge Sonia Sotomayor. Claret's petition for certiorari was refused by the Supreme Court. Maurice and the USC wide receiver Mike Williams were both hoping to enter the draft early, but were then barred from the draft by the NFL. Later, because they both signed agents before being denied the opportunity to join the NFL draft, the NCAA refused to reinstate the college eligibility of Claret or Williams. While the NFL was successful in blocking Claret and Williams from entering the draft in 2004, they did allow Pitt's wideout Larry Fitzgerald to enter the 2004 draft, despite only playing at Pitt for two years without redshirting due to him spending a year at Valley Forge Military Academy in college, after high school for academic reasons. The NFL considered that to satisfy the three-year rule. The league considered Claret and Fitzgerald's cases to be separate. After his loss in court, Maurice was to wait for the 2005 draft, but was also not allowed to return to college football. Later that year, things became even worse. Maurice met with an Israeli mobster who provided him with cash, cars, and bodyguards. All these were under an agreement that Maurice would pay 60% of his rookie contract to pay back the debt he owed him. This was obviously a horrible deal, but then Maurice was broke and desperate, so he agreed to such bad terms. Even though he was knee-deep in debt, Maurice went on an irresponsible and dumb spending spree. He started partying uncontrollably with the excuse that he was trying to fill a void in his life. He drank too much, played, and womanized. Distracted by his lifestyle, he didn't put any effort into getting ready for the NFL Combine in 2005. Although he showed up there, he ran a disappointing 4.72 and 4.82 seconds in the 40-yard dash. He then refused to do any workout and was referred to as slow-mo by the sports media, who were largely critical of his combine performance. 
Ohio State also declined to allow him to take part in a private workout for pro scouts in Columbus because it wanted to avoid a circus situation. But in an unexpected move, Maurice was drafted in the 2005 NFL Draft with the final pick of the third round by the Denver Broncos. Although many experts felt that he would fall to the sixth or seventh round if he was drafted at all. The Pittsburgh Steelers, a team that needed a running back due to the uncertain future of Jerome Bettis, publicly said that they would not draft Claret. Bettis ended up returning for what would be his final NFL season. However, Claret turned out to be unimpressive in the Denver Broncos' preseason training camp. Since he had not played a game in two years or practice in over a year, he entered training camp weighing 248 pounds, more than 20 pounds overweight. He was also slow to recover from an injury and often showed up to training drunk. He was lazy and always in a particular spot. Despite his unimpressive training camp, Claret signed a four-year contract on July 28, 2005 with the Broncos in which he gave up $413,000 of guaranteed money to secure an incentive-laden deal. Claret signed this deal against the advice of his former agents Steve Feldman and Josh Lukes. His motivation was to replace the proposed deal with a package that would pay him first round money if he rushed for 1,000 yards in multiple seasons. However, after further disappointments and incidents with his coaches and never playing a preseason game, Claret was released on waivers on August 28, 2005, only a month after signing a contract and before playing a down in the NFL. As is standard procedure in the NFL, for 24 hours after his release, other teams could have claimed him and taken on his contract. So after the 24 hours, Maurice was freed from his contract and able to negotiate with any team. In December 2005, Maurice was in talks to play for the Steubenville Stampede, a squad in the North Division of the American Indoor Football League. According to Jim Terry, manager of the Stampede, he had been in contact with Maurice's agent and they seemed interested in working with them. He claimed Maurice was broke and had something to prove. However, Maurice never signed with the Stampede. Maurice also expressed interest in playing for NFL Europe. Josh Lukes, Maurice's agent, reported that Maurice was going to sign with the NFL on January 2, 2006 and was expected to be allocated to NFL Europe. There were also discussions about Maurice playing for the semi-pro Eastern Indoor Football League team, the Mahoning Valley Hitmen. Maurice ended up not signing with any of them, and this meant only one thing, he was truly broke. With the disappointment, he sunk into depression and was always drunk. He had a lot of loans to pay, and he was jobless. Looking for a way out, he turned to crime and made decisions he would later regret. On January 1st, 2006, police announced that they were searching for Claret about two incidents of armed robbery that took place outside the Opium Lounge Dance Club in Columbus. Please state your emergency. Someone came up to this lady and robbed her. He said it was Maurice Claret. Maurice allegedly robbed two people at gunpoint before escaping in a white SUV with two unidentified persons. He reportedly made off with only a cell phone valued at $150 belonging to one of the victims. Maurice turned himself in to police the next day, which happened to be the same day the Buckeyes were defeating Notre Dame in the Fiesta Bowl in Tempe, Arizona, the very game in which Maurice last played college football. He faced two counts of aggravated robbery and was later released on a $50,000 bond. It didn't just end there. The next month, Maurice was indicted by a Franklin County grand jury on two counts of aggravated robbery with gun specifications and five other counts. If convicted, he was to be sentenced up to 25 years in prison. On February 22, 2006, Maurice pleaded not guilty to aggravated robbery charges and was then released on a $20,000 bail until his trial began. Two weeks before his trial date, Maurice fired his lawyers, William Satina and Robert Krapek. The privately retained attorneys had filed a motion two days earlier saying they wanted to withdraw their counsel, claiming that Maurice was not paying their fees or cooperating in his defense. This didn't come as a surprise since he was both broke and stubborn. In the early hours of August 9, 2006, Maurice was arrested in Columbus after he made an illegal U-turn and led the police on a chase in a sports utility vehicle reportedly belonging to his uncle. After Claret drove over a police spike strip, the chase ended in a nearby restaurant parking lot. 
His next action didn't help. Police said they were forced to secure a cloth around Claret's mouth after he allegedly spat at the officers. According to Columbus Police Sergeant Mike Woods, the officers discovered a katana, a zambato, a loaded AK-47 variant, and two loaded handguns in his vehicle along with an open bottle of Grey Goose vodka. The police requested that the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives perform a trace on the firearms to determine if Maurice violated federal gun laws. The officers used a mace to subdue Claret after attempts to subdue him with a taser proved ineffective because he was wearing Kevlar body armor. Following the arrest, he was arraigned on the latest charges on August 10th in Franklin County Municipal Court in Columbus. During the arraignment, Judge Andrea C. Peoples set his bond on the charges of carrying a concealed weapon without a permit and failure to maintain the current lane at $5 million. In setting the bond, Peoples agreed with prosecutors that Maurice was now a flight risk or could attempt to intimidate witnesses in his upcoming robbery trial, so Maurice remained lodged in the Franklin County Correction Center. However, the initial $1.1 million bond for the robbery charge was revoked by trial judge David Face. According to a Columbus Dispatch report, Maurice, who was due to be tried for his January arrest, was in the neighborhood of one of the principal witnesses against him at the time the events of August 9th occurred, and this wasn't good for Maurice. With more evidence coming up, Maurice knew he needed to do the right thing if he wanted to be helped. On September 18th, Maurice filed a guilty plea to the charges in a plea bargain that involved the recent events as well as the earlier robbery charges. It was clear he did it. He was sentenced by Judge David Face to seven and a half years in prison with the possibility of applying for early release after three and a half years. As part of the plea agreement, the prosecution agreed not to object to early release if and when Maurice applied for it. On December 14th, it was announced that Maurice would be changing prisons to a close security prison in a single person cell at Toledo Correctional Institution, where he would be able to eat and exercise with other inmates. While serving his sentence at the Toledo Correctional Institution, Maurice enrolled in a distance learning program at Ohio University, working towards earning a bachelor's degree in geriatrics and gerontology. During his time in prison, Maurice shifted his attention to developing his mind by reading psychology books and as much business-related literature as he could in his attempt to turn his life around. He became more sober and gave in for the better. He wrote his thoughts in a journal he themed, The Mind of Maurice Claret. He also wanted to take these out to the public and because he did not have internet access in the prison, he sent his entries to his girlfriend who posted them for him. In one post, Maurice summed up his attitude towards prison by saying, Understand my struggle so you can respect my hustle. I am never coming back here. Believe that. Never. I am cool on this. It is first class living from the day I get out. I will never settle for less again. That goes for his communication, personal relationships, housing, education, friendships, and travel arrangements. He said he had the fire in his eyes. Through sharing his life story, he would later become a much sought after motivational speaker. Following his good behavior on April 7, 2010, Judge Face granted him early release. He stayed in prison for three and a half years, although he was ordered to enter Mary Haven, a halfway house in Columbus, for up to six months. He was then released on August 23, 2010, and he then requested permission from Franklin County Common Pleas Court Judge David Face to attend a tryout for the Omaha Nighthawks of the United Football League. The motion was approved on August 25th. As part of his sentence, Claret requires court permission to leave the state of Ohio. He needed to bounce back to the right path, and he did. On August 30th, 2010, the Omaha Nighthawks of the United Football League signed Claret, and on October 1st, 2010, he played his first meaningful game of any sort in eight years, rushing for 12 yards on five attempts against the Sacramento Mountain Lions. As the Nighthawks' number two running back, Maurice finished the season with 154 yards on the ground on 37 attempts and a touchdown. He also caught 12 passes for 98 yards and returned a kickoff for 13 yards. It was quite a comeback, although the UFL suspended operations in 2012. 
In November 2012, Maurice was invited back to Ohio State to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the undefeated championship season of 2002. It was an emotional time for Maurice, and all he could wish for was the younger ones not to follow in his previous footsteps. Having suffered from depression, Clarette joined other mental health advocates in August 2013 in promoting the expansion of Medicaid in Ohio. He also spoke at prisons and juvenile detention facilities and worked with youth football camps to share his story so others do not repeat it. Maurice has also reconnected with Ohio State by taking courses and working out with current football players. In December of 2013, he was featured in Youngstown Boys, an ESPN 30 for 30 documentary, which included extensive interviews with family, friends, and associates. He was invited back to Ohio State University as part of a ceremony recognizing the national championship team he played on. While he was there, he also spoke to an audience of about 500 at the Archie Griffin Grand Ballroom in the Ohio Union discussing past troubles, his ongoing rehabilitation, and the restoration of his reputation. In 2016, Maurice Claret founded The Red Zone, a behavioral health agency in Youngstown, Ohio. The agency offers mental health services, addiction and recovery services, school-based social work, and more. He also spoke out on the importance of education and training to help people get jobs and stay out of trouble. In 2018, he campaigned for Joe Schiavone in the Ohio gubernatorial election. He also worked with Mike DeWine, who eventually became the governor of Ohio, to improve education, workforce training, and recovery from addiction. This helped and was evident in 2018 when Youngstown City Schools released a report that showed that 283 students who received services from the Red Zone saw their GPA increase by an average of 16.5%. This was a huge success for the agency and its clients. In 2018, Maurice also started working on a business podcast called Business and Biceps with Corey Gregory and John Fosco. The podcast has consistently ranked near the top of the business podcast rankings and in the top 100 overall podcasts in the Apple iTunes store. Maurice worked as a consultant to the Collegiate Athletic Department and was later appointed as a member of the Youngstown Warren Regional Chamber of Commerce. Maurice Claret's story is still being written. But so far, it's been quite a journey. From high school hero to college champion to jail time and back again. His comeback is a testament to the power of hard work, determination, and second chances. He's not done yet even as he's overcome great challenges to build a new life and help others along the way. Also, with the Red Zone, Business and Biceps, and his work with collegiate athletes, he's making a difference and changing lives for the better. His story shows that it's never too late to turn things around and make a positive impact on the world. Thanks for joining us on this journey. Hope you learned a thing or two. Let us know what you think about everything that happened to Maurice Claret, and also don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. Until then, see you in our next video. Bye.